Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. And God wants to let you know he is aware of everything you do for him. He is aware of everything that goes on in your life, that how your motives are based on his word, how you love pleasing him. And he knows those of you who really don't care what he wants out of you. But for those of you who do care, it's not a waste. Whatever you do for God is never wasted. It's not wasted. So I'm going to read it to you right now. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. My beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And sometimes it gets tiring. This is Pat's two cents now. Sometimes life can get tiring. Sometimes our efforts can feel like they're pointless. Sometimes it feels like we're spinning our wheels like the little mouse spinning their wheels in that little mouse trap, getting nowhere. They're just going around in circles. You got me going in circles. And if we get frustrated and we get tired. And then the scripture tells us, do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And sometimes we want to faint. We want to sit, we want to fold our arms, take a coffee break for the next 10 years of our life. Then we just don't want to be bothered. We don't want to be needed. We don't want to be called. We don't want to be asked anything. And we get tired of getting our feelings hurt. We do what we do for the Lord and we feel like there's very little interest in it. We feel like folks don't want to hear what we got to say. You know, we must not be all that good in what we're doing. I've been there a lot of times. I mean, we all go through it. Those of us who try to serve the Lord. Those of us who try to live a holy life from moment to moment. And sometimes it feels like that is in vain. And all of our efforts is like, yeah, we want to say, what's it all about, Alfie? You know, what's going on? What's the point? But we have to remember when people show no interest, sometimes things are happening in their lives and they don't have the time at that moment. When the views are low, when the there are people out there that you're working with or you're involved in uh, projects with, and they don't seem to take much interest in you. They don't seem to be interested in your well-being, your welfare. They don't seem to be interested in what's going on in your life because you're so busy doing the Lord's work. And then when you feel like you need a friend, everybody else is busy too. So we have to remember God is our friend. And sometimes that's the one we have to turn to. Because he's he's available 24-7. He's never too busy to hear what we've got to say. He's never too busy to fellowship with us, to sup with us, and us with him. He's never too busy for us. But sometimes we, we're looking around for that human touch. We're looking around for the human element. <laughs> and... When it seems like nobody's interested in what we're doing, when it seems like it bears very little fruit, what God is looking at is your heart. He sees how much fruit you are bearing for him, even though what you're doing may not be bearing much fruit at present. It does not mean it won't down the road. So the bottom line is, serve him with serve him with fear and trembling as you give to the lord be a cheerful giver to the same measure that you serve him 
will be the same measure that you reap. You reap what you sow. And when you serve the Lord from your heart, when you serve the Lord from the goodness of your heart, you serve him because you love him. You serve him because you love God's people. You love people, period. And you want to see as many as possible get to know your loving, beautiful God. Amado mio, he is my beloved. When you serve him that way, even if other people don't seem to be interested, God, you've got his undivided attention. That's what's so beautiful. All these millions of souls on this planet who are serving God or living for God, obeying him, communing with him and each other in love, unfeigned love. That means genuine love. Nothing phony in it. You are real to the core. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That is such a beautiful thing. It puts a smile on God's face. And if nobody else is looking or booking, when you have God's attention, you have reached the height of success in whatever it is you're doing. When you're in the center of God's will, that right there is automatic success. Even when it seems like you're failing, even when it looks like you're falling through and things are coming against you and things are coming against it. You are a success, no matter what. Okay, here are a few examples. Remember when Moses was told to lead the Israelites through the wilderness, and it started out with him getting the Jews out of the hands of Egypt, and, and God finally convinces Pharaoh to let his people go. And Moses has the people, he's leading them through the wilderness. And he gets them right there, right at the edge of the shoreline. And there's no way to go because there's an ocean in front of them. And then all of a sudden, God allows Pharaoh's heart to be hardened. And he sends them to, to uh, because God has a plan in mind. He's going to work a miracle. One thing I found when God allows a pursuit of the enemy, to come on your tail and you're in the center of God's will, you have a a given victory, but there is a reason for God doing so. When he's getting ready to bless you, he wants your enemies to see it. Like Psalms 23, he will set a table before you in the presence of your enemies and they will gnash with their teeth as they watch you with hatred and disdain. God blessing your life. God showering you with blessing, promoting you, exalting you. And they hate it. They hate seeing that. Like the kids in school, the little dummy kids who resent the smart kids and they make fun of the kids because they know that they don't have what the smart kids have. So they try to make the smart kids feel bad about themselves in order for the dummy kids to feel good about themselves because they know they're not about much. (laughs) Well, that's a form of jealousy. And that is the works of the flesh, so to speak, that Galatians 5 talks about. But let me tell you this, no matter what, here we got Moses. Let's get back to that example. Moses is right there. And that, I believe, is where that uh, expression came from, between the devil and the deep blue sea. (laughs) Like, where do you go? So here he is. He's got the sea in front of him. He's got Pharaoh behind him. And the only thing standing between the enemy and him and and the Jews is the pillar of fire. That's the only thing. And God put that pillar of fire there. So think about this. They can, they are within eye reach. They can see each other. They might be far, but they can see each other. That's how close the Egyptians were on their tail. But God set up that pillar of fire 
so that they could not get through the fire to get to the Jews. And right in front of their eyes, God instructs Moses to hold his stick over the ocean. And it probably looked to the Jews like, wow, this was a waste of time. All of this time, all of this effort going through this wilderness only to be killed by the by the uh by pharaoh and his army but what did god do because they were in the center of his will they obeyed him god had him hold his stick over the ocean and everybody the enemy and god's people got to witness the parting of the waters and they were instructed to cross over on dry ground. That sand was dry. Do you hear me? St totally dry. And after all those thousands and thousands and thousands of people crossed over, that must have taken hours. And here Pharaoh is gnashing at, at his teeth because he can't get through the fire to get to the people. And then after the Israelites have crossed over, God removes the pillar of fire. Now, why would God do that? It's going to enable them to cross over too. But that's what God wants. Because his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts, higher than your thoughts. <laughs> and here they're like, oh no, here they come. And the waters are still piled high on each side. The ground is still dry. And then what did God do? God softened and muddied up the sand. So it made it hard for them to cross. Now they're, they're, they're uh, trudging through in this muddy sand. Now it's difficult. The wheels are getting stuck. The horses are getting bogged down and sinking into the sand. So what does that do? That makes them get stuck. They can't move forward as easily as the Jews did. And when they all get in there, what does God do? He releases the wall of water and bam, all the enemy is killed. All those soldiers and all the horses and chariots at the bottom of the deep blue sea. And Israel got to watch their enemy get totally destroyed right before their eyes. See, when God is for you, when scripture says, when God is for you, who can be against you? God knows how to get you from point A to point B, no matter what obstacles your enemies put up against you. No matter how many ways they try to work against you, sabotage you, God knows how to get you from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. If God's in it, baby, you're going to win it. You hear me? No weapon formed against you will prosper. So know that your labor is not in vain. Because what you're doing is for the Lord. You're doing it in obedience to the Lord. You're doing it being in the center of God's will. God's got your back, baby. He's got your enemy too. And he knows how to deal with him. So when he allows the enemy to come in like a flood, what does God do? He'll lift up a standard against your enemy like he did that day. He will show out. So know that you are in the best place possible, no matter how many people reject you, no matter how many people don't like you, no matter how many people backbite you, talk about you behind your back, no matter how many people try to, to, to uh, defraud your name or, or uh, kill your, uh, destroy your reputation try to make you look bad, try to sabotage your success, no matter what they try to do to hold you back. You ever see how an archer aims 
at a target. Picture yourself as that bow and arrow. Picture yourself as the arrow. And picture your enemy as the, as the archer's hand pulling that string back. Because that's what it feels like in life. Like there are always forces, people and forces trying to pull us back. Always trying to pull you back. Always trying to sabotage your success. There's always somebody out there that doesn't like you. While that man's hand is pulling or that woman's hand is pulling that string back with the arrow attached to it. And you're the arrow, but they're pulling you back. You're the arrow, but they're pulling you back. Further back, further back, further back. But God is the bow and arrow and God is the one doing the aim. Mm hmm and God says when to release that arrow. And one day God will tell the enemy, release my servant. And when that hand releases that arrow, because he's pulled you back so far, it forces that arrow to catapult and soar towards its target, towards the goal, towards the finish line. God knows how to get you there. He will use your enemy to get you there, if need be. But he will get you there. So your labor is never in vain. Because God, who called you to that labor, God, who called you to that assignment, God, who called you to that ministry, God who called you to that outreach, God who called you to that level of education, whatever it is, who called you to that marriage, who called you to that church, wherever he called you to, called you to that vocation, he will get you all the way. No matter how far the enemy pulls you back, God will one day take control and say, now, release him. And when, I mean, Satan has to obey God. The demons have to obey. So when that release goes and the arrow is set free because it's been pulled back so far for so long, it will be amazing to watch where God takes that arrow. And that arrow is you you will be amazed to see how far God will take you after being pulled back for so long, after being held down for so long, after being shut up and silenced and ignored for so long, after experiencing rejection for so long. God works in, 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 in uh, paradoxes. The more you're hated, the more love you'll get at the end. The more you're rejected, the more acceptance and approval, the more confirmation, affirmation, the more God will vindicate and validate you in the eyes of all. So know that God's got you. He is on your side. He is for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? I'm not only preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. God bless you. Be encouraged. Hold your head up high because you got the right one on your side. Amen. God bless you.